Welcome to the 8th Annual Seattle Area. The Seattle Epidemiologic Research and Information Center, in collaboration with the Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA Employee Education System, and the University of Washington Departments of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, presents the 8th Annual Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Clinical Research Methods Summer Session. Uh, good morning. Welcome to the 8th Annual Seattle Eric Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Clinical Research Methods Summer Session. My name is Ed Boyko. I'm the course director. Uh, the title of uh, today's course is Epidemiologic Aspects of Military Post-Deployment Health Conditions, Natural Disasters, and Terrorism. I'm pleased to introduce to you today uh, Dr. Dean Kilpatrick. Uh, he is a, a distinguished university professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and director of the National Crime Victims Research and Treatment Center at the Medical University of South Carolina. He and his colleagues have conducted epidemiologic studies of numerous disasters, including the Loma Prieta earthquake, Hurricanes Andrew and Hugo, the 2004 hurricanes in Florida, the Pan Am 103 terrorist bombings, and the 2001 terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center in New York. The title of his talk today is Epidemiologic Aspects of Natural Disasters. Dr. Kilpatrick. There are kind of two schools of thought on the importance of theory. Some people think theory is really important and some people don't. Uh, I'm one of those that thinks that, that uh, theory is important um, even though I am a clinician. Uh, because I think that theory uh, helps guide us in terms of what to look for. Uh, if we're designing a study, it helps us decide uh, what it is we need to measure in a way and what kind of relationships we would uh, expect to uh, exist between things. And I think it guides us also in terms of our, uh, the data analytic process or the hypothesis testing at the end of the day. Anyway, so I'll keep the theory down to a little bit, but, but what I really want to do is to talk about th uh, three theories that I think have, have uh, maybe to some degree dominated uh, disaster research, and that is the diathesis stress uh, framework for looking at things, conservation of resources um, model that has also been very important, and then more of a clinical model uh, that, that is certainly important to mental health professionals. Uh, let me start out with diathesis, diathesis stress framework. Uh, and that is, I mean, this is an old model that's been there for a long time, and it basically views the degree of exposure as a risk factor that influences personal vulnerabilities. And so if you have, you differ in terms of the amount of personal vulnerabilities you have, and then you apply stress to that, then you would expect to get somewhat of a different outcome. And, uh, and basically, there have been a lot of uh, measures that have, that are a lot of uh, dependent measures, so to speak, or, or outcomes that have been looked at there. But uh, three examples would be post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, depression, or even changes in some biological measures. So the basic thing about that model is, is that you would, you would expect that people who have who are exposed to stress have different levels of strength and weakness, and those with, who, who have the weaknesses would be those that would develop the problems afterwards. Now, protective factors within that framework are, are viewed as things that, that basically uh, offset some of the weaknesses or, or provide some increased ability to deal with the stress. And just one example there that, uh, that has gotten a lot of attention in, in the uh, disaster literature would be social support. So in some cases, uh, you know, it has been reported that people who have high social support, even though they may have been exposed to a very stressful di disaster and may have some weakness there, uh, that that is a way of offsetting some of the weakness in terms of the, the uh, and therefore is a protective factor. Um, Another uh, theory, which uh, is called the conservation of resources uh, theory, which has uh, been developed by Steve Hobfald and his colleagues, um, 
really focuses on resource loss as a primary factor in predicting the psychological impact of stressful events. And so his point is, and he as I will get to in just a second, um, he defines resources very broadly, but it includes physical things as well as, as uh, relationships and other types of things. And what his model really says is that um, if you lose resources, it's a bad thing. Uh, it's a bad thing. And, and so the more resources you lose of these different kinds of things, the more likely uh, we are to predict that you would uh, develop uh, various kinds of problems, including uh, PTSD uh, as well as depression. I think he originally focused on depression, but now it's been broadened. And one thing that comes to mind if you're uh, in a disaster or studying disasters is that one thing that people lose a lot of is resources. I mean, not only do you lose your stuff, but you lose, uh, in many cases, uh, sometimes you even lose your job because your job doesn't exist anymore. Sometimes you lose, at least I found this, this is going to be a personal testimonial. After Hugo, I lost a lot of spare time. I didn't have spare time for a long time. I lost the ability to do a lot of things that I like to do. I mean, like, I like to enjoy the benefits of electricity, for example. <laughs> Uh, electricity is a wonderful thing. Uh, how many of you have been for a while without electricity? What's the longest anybody's been without electricity? I mean, when you're camping, I guess that wouldn't count, but unless you take your generator. A day? A day? Three days, five days. Five days. Uh, well, it took, uh, where I live, it took a month to get electricity back. So. That was bad. That was very bad. It was also very, very hot and very humid, and without electricity, there's no air conditioning. You know, there's also no lights. There's also no refrigeration. There's also no, yeah. so at any rate, you lose a lot of things, and then after a disaster, too, your, your, um, your spare time goes away because you have to be doing a lot of things, you know, like dealing with FEMA and insurance companies and a lot of, lot of fun things along that line as well as trying to sort of rebuild your life. So there's a lot of resources that get lost. So uh, the, uh, the notion is, is that your resources are important to you at a time when you're stressed a lot, but then if, it's tr if you're stressed because of a disaster, then uh, those disasters have depleted a lot of your resources. Now, if you lose your resources, that causes distress. And then the way that Hopfall talks about it, uh, th so resources are defined as objects, personal characteristics, conditions, or energies that are valued in their own right, or that are valued because they act as, as conduits to the achievement of protection of valued resources. So he talks about uh, the resources in that some, some ways when you lose resources, it becomes somewhat of a downward spiral. And so th then you get more distressed, and then you lose more resources. And it's hard to dig, you, dig your way out of that, that hole. And, and what I wanted to do is to show you just this is an example from a, a study that uh, Sandro Galea, my colleague, and, uh, and actually Steve Hobfall did that I think is either just out or, or uh, will soon be out, that illustrates uh, how um, loss of resources or degree of loss of resources was related to how people were doing in terms of PTSD and in terms of major depression after 9-11. And so people were categorized in terms of having low resource loss based on Hop Falls measure, medium resource loss or high resource loss. And uh, again, I may want some audience participation here for you to describe what you see as the relationship between uh, the amount of resource loss and the amount of PTSD and depression. Non-linear. Non Non-linear? OK, yeah, that's one thing. It doesn't seem to make a difference until you get into the high resource loss. And what's interesting? is that both outcomes are elevated. Right. So both with depression and PTSD, you find that particularly those with the high resource loss, and by the way, this is an epidemiological sample, uh, 
uh, of people from New York, uh, around Manhattan actually, and the greater New York area. Um, and so it, it includes the broad range of both PTSD and depression. And as you see that in that high group, you've got between uh, 30 and 40 percent of the people meeting di DSM-4 diagnostic criteria for either major depressive episode or, uh, or for PTSD. So that's a very high rate in the general population sample. And what it's saying is the amount of resource loss, particularly if it's high, uh, is very associated with, with uh, increased uh, risk of both PTSD and major depression. Uh, another model is, is really more the clinical model, and again, if those of you who are card-carrying mental health uh, professionals and all that, this is probably the model you're most used to, and that is basically if you have a history of psychopathology, dealing with people who already have problems, uh, that they're more vulnerable to a new traumatic event, you know, through uh, the disaster exposure and whatnot due to the fact that they've already got their hands full, I mean, in terms of trying to deal with life, and they've already uh, had these problems. And so, you know, one would expect that if people have a prior history of drug and alcohol abuse or PTSD or schizophrenia or depression or some of these things, that when, when a disaster happens to them, they're going to be very vulnerable. Um, in the uh, days after uh, Rita and Katrina, or Katrina first, I guess, and then Rita not too long after that. Uh, we got a fair number of, of calls from people, and, and one of the interesting ones was from NIDA. And what they were hearing was that basically among the evacuees that uh, they were having people in, you know, just regular, they weren't really health clinics. I mean, it was like in the Astrodome and, and various uh, places around. And they were having people going into DTs, and they were having people who were, uh, you know, uh, drug abusing people who were seizing up uh, because, or, or going into withdrawal because of basically lack of the methadone that they had been on before and all that. And so they were very concerned about what was going to happen to people not only who, who had these alcohol and drug problems, but also what about people who were in remission? and what was going to happen given all the stress that they had. So there was a lot, and then of course uh, a lot of people in New Orleans who could not evacuate because of, uh, you know, <coughs> chronic mental illness uh, and just couldn't get it together to get out of there and nobody, I mean, you know, they're on the streets, they don't, they don't have the resources to get out on their own. Then, then there was a concern about them and what happened to them and so, but part of the thing about this clinical model, it's a piece of the picture and part of this is not rocket science either, that if people have already got mental health problems, severe ones in particular, well then they're going to not do too well when they get exposed to, you know, a major disaster. So that's the sort of clinical model. And it views what happens in the disaster as a major stressor, which, uh, you know, makes their problems worse. Now, let me, let me uh, get to the actual topic of this, which is the epidemiology of disasters, and I'm going to go through part of this kind of quickly. Uh, but there's some things about if you're wanting to do a study um, after a disaster, there's some things about sampling and participant recruiting that are important. First of all, if you're studying a disaster, there may be several different ways you can go about it and several different types of people you might be interested in studying. One would be direct survivors of the, of the disaster. Um, and and uh, a couple of examples, I mean, and some of these, these are referenced, uh, is that there have been a lot of studies done of uh, disorders among survivors of the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, so. Again, there were studies that looked at people who were direct survivors of that or who were family members of, of people who were killed, and they identified the specific people who were involved, and they did studies of that. Now, again, some of this is so common sense, it's, I just I'm, I'm loathe to even mention it to you because it might insult your intelligence. But if you have been directly affected um, and you've been physically injured, your house has been destroyed, you know, all of that, um, or you've had a relative who was killed as a part of this, guess what? The effects are going to be worse on you than they are on, you know, people who have not uh, suffered that same fate as a part of the disaster. 
And, uh, and again, as I, as I mentioned before, it's possible that people who are involved in litigation may not be um, totally representative of the, of the whole population exposed for a couple of reasons. I mean, one of which is suing somebody is a big deal. I mean, it really is in your whole life. I mean, uh, I mean how many of you have been involved in any type of expert witness stuff or in lawsuits one way or another? Okay, well, you know what happens is you just lay in your whole life open and, you know, they can go to your, they'll, they'll dig up the person who hated you in high school and the, that person will tell them all the dirt and if you've had any mental health treatment before or anything bad that's happened in your life, it's going to be open for public display. So I would submit to you that for the most part, people who are willing to sue, uh, you know, know that they're in for some scrutiny and so therefore they're reluctant to do that in, in many cases unless they have been their their perception is their injuries have been pretty severe. Now I know there's other people who would argue that a different way. Anyway, another group that you can study is family members uh, of victims of a disaster. And uh, as I mentioned uh, I will be talking about the Pan Am 103, an evaluation study we did of family members in that case. But every single one of the people in that study had lost at least one family member, uh, you know, lost them in the sense of they were killed. So obviously that's a very, very heavily impacted uh, group. And then a third group that gets studied a lot in disasters are rescue or recovery workers, sort of first responders. And there have been several studies of, of those, uh, uh, you know, throughout uh, in, in response to a lot of disasters. Um, but, but basically that's just one of the, the sort of three groups that gets looked at a lot. Now, um, rescue workers tend to do better as a group than, uh, than some of the other uh, so, than the direct victims or the surviving family members for a variety of reasons. I mean, first of all, sometimes their injury rates are lower. Now, there's some exceptions to that. For example, uh, there were a lot of people who got injured. I mean, there were a lot of people who got killed, first responders who got killed in 9-11, and then there were some who weren't killed but who were injured. But for the most part, Rescue workers have planned for this. They know what they're doing. They're in shape. They're prepared. Uh, and those, as opposed to just sitting around like the rest of us, fat, dumb, and happy, thinking that nothing's ever going to happen to us. So we haven't prepared anything. I mean, you know, we're not ready for it. And so we, we <coughs> therefore, if you, if you have some training and preparation, it actually helps. And, and so that's one of the reasons these folks uh, do better. Now, it's also possible that, uh, that there's some self-selection here. For example, if you're risk averse, if you don't like excitement, then going into the first responder business is not a job for you. So it may be that there's some individual characteristics there that lead people to seek out this level of work. And so therefore, you know, what would be very, very distressing to the librarian uh, may be kind of a fun night on the job, you know, for some of these other folks. So you got to bear that in mind as well. Um, so another group that you can look at is the general population. So that, for example, there you're not just looking at people who've been injured or who, you know, family members of injured people or self or first responders. You're looking at a variety of people in the whole population. And so there are several of the studies. Uh, uh, Palinkas and, and, and crew did a study of, um, of the uh, psychological disorders and social uh, relations with family conflicts in residents after the Exxon uh, Valdez oil spill and used a... Uh, uh, you know, a general population sampling approach, uh, you know, to look at several communities as well as control communities uh, in terms of the, the oil spills. Actually, Bill Schlinger and crew um, did, a, did a study very shortly after 9-11 in which they used a web-based survey to look at the whole U.S. in terms of not PTSD or disorders per se, but to look at people uh, you know, and just how they were affected by the whole 9-11 and the terrorist uh, people using, as I say, an internet-based uh, web-enabled sample for the whole, um, whole U.S. population. And generally, and again, this sort of, I think will make sense to you if you think it through a little bit, 
in general, you're going to find a lower prevalence of disorders, mental disorders, among the general population sample than you would among uh, samples of directly affected people or indirectly affected people or rescue workers. And why would that be? This is another, this is, can be viewed as a rhetorical question, but you're free to answer it if you want to. Why, why would you expect that? Not everybody at once. Could I ask the question again? Why would you expect the prevalence of mental disorders to be less in the general population than among uh, direct victims or, or family members of victims? Dose response? Dose response, meaning that the dose of trauma that you've received is, reduces the uh, farther away from you, you are from the traumatic event, and therefore you expect less of a psychopathological response. Well, let me rephrase that a little bit. Uh, the way I would rephrase it uh, in the interest of time would be that uh, in the general population, you've got people with all levels of exposure ranging from a lot to a little. And so if you average in the people who've had a little exposure uh, with those that have had a lot, then in a general population base, it would dilute the effects of the trauma exposure. And you would see it in the people who've been exposed a lot. But then people who haven't been exposed as much, you would see it much less, if that makes sense. I think I'll stop there and move on. Um, uh, in terms of sampling, obviously, if you use an epidemiological study with general population sample, we can consider the impact of disasters in the general population. And then, but it's important to think about what we're trying to do here and what kind of sampling we want to use uh, and make it match up with, uh, with to whom we want to make inferences in our, in our study after we do it. And then obviously, if you have random sampling procedures, either uh, random digit dialing for telephone or block listing and randomization for some sort of in-person sampling, you then can actually uh, obtain a random sample of the general population or the best estimate that you can get of the general population. And in, in those cases, you can make inferences to the entire population from your sample. So there's some real advantages to doing that. Um, we may, however, be interested in a specific group, minorities or uh, you know, some, some other group that we want to uh, make sure that we have enough to look at. And you can obviously oversample that group. Uh, and, but, but obviously, if you oversample a group, then you need to statistically uh, adjust for that um, in terms of any analyses you're doing if you want to make the, the, you know, the generalization to the, the population uh, at large. Uh, what should you look at in terms of a disaster? Say you're doing, I want to do a disaster study, you say. Well, what should you look at? What kind of things should you include? One of the things you should include is basically the degree of exposure to the disaster. I mean, that's obviously the key variable. Uh, and that's going to differ from disaster to disaster. For example, uh, if you're doing a natural disaster study, then uh, you know there's some measures of exposure that you might use, such as uh, how much damage did your house su sustain? You know, how far were you from the area that was most hit by the storm? You know, did you know anybody that was you know killed? Um, how long were you without uh, power or uh, you, you know basic utilities? Uh, did you evacuate or not? I mean, it could be that, for example, in a disaster that. Uh, the, there's one nice thing about hurricanes and only one nice thing, and that is that you get some warning, unlike earthquakes and, and some other types of things. So it may be that you ran away, I mean, it, which is a good strategy. I mean, there's no need for you to be there during it. I would suggest everybody. I mean, we have a psychology internship program, and our interns come the 1st of August every year. And so part of my, and I'm director of the internship, and so part of the thing that I do is I said, you know, you need, you need to, uh, here's the weather channel, here's... Uh, weatherunderground.com, which is basically has, uh, you know, a, a really good prediction stuff where you can look at the actual computer models and everything. Who says that I'm still obsessed with Hugo? But at any rate, um, 
But I say, you know, pay close attention, and there will be a time when I say, run away, in, in which case I would like you to run away and then come back when it's over. And um, because there's no, uh, there's no education from actually getting hit by one. But then it can still tear your stuff up even if you're not there. That's one thing that I neglected during Hugo. I ran away, but it still tore stuff up when I was gone. Anyway, uh, there are other dimensions, though, of other types of disasters. In, in some cases, like 9-11, the proximity to the to the ground zero was an important uh, measure of exposure. So whatever disaster you're doing, you're going to have to sort of figure out what would be the logical measures of exposure to that disaster uh, that you would look at. Now, um, in some ways, and this is, you could do this any number of ways, but I mean, in some cases, people do differentiate exposure levels into these different groups in terms of high exposure, medium, and low. Uh, there, there are other ways you can do it than this, but sometimes getting some um, distinction around your exposure conditions in a general population sample would be, would be a good thing to do. Um, now, human-made or technological disasters, uh, in some cases, even though you have a large geographical region, it's, it might be easy to figure out high and low uh, or direct and indirect victims, as described above. Um, and then, so uh, having said that, I mean, in terms of sampling within this broad region and then, and then sort of uh, breaking people down in terms of their level of exposure, it's really important also um, you know, to look at general population as well as sometimes the rescue and first responders. I mean, there may be some specific reasons to look at those in, in and above uh, looking at a general population or just directly uh, exposed individuals. So if you're looking at post-traumatic stress disorder, um, again, um, you, if you're looking at the broad population, you'll tend to get a, a smaller uh, proportion of people who have PTSD or depression, for example, in, a, in an entire population-based study than you will uh, if you're only looking at people who've been directly affected. And then generally, if you have people who've been directly affected, you will tend to have uh, a higher proportion of people with, with post-traumatic stress disorder. And I would add to what's on the slide, depression as well. And this is, uh, um, <clears throat> my colleague uh, Sandro has a <clears throat> an article that's out that's referenced. And, and basically, if you look at people who've been directly affected, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent, some of the studies have indicated, of directly affected people may have PTSD. It gets down to uh, 10 to 20 percent among rescue workers, and it gets down to between 5 and 10 percent in the general population. So in other words, that's just a rough estimate of, about what you can expect depending on who you're, you're looking at. Um, I want to uh, mention about uh, Fran Norris's review, which was done fairly recently. And um, basically, uh, Fran um, if you ever want to know more than you ever wanted to know about disasters, uh, Google Fran Norris on the internet and you will come up with some really great stuff. But anyway, she did a summary of uh, over 225 samples that had, had been done looking at disaster research. And these were samples from 34 different countries. She looked at um, the findings from these studies or the outcome measures from five and classified them into these five primary outcomes that people have done in terms of disaster research. Kind of physiological problems or somatic concerns, nonspecific distress, various types of anxiety that did not include PTSD, major depression in PTSD. And based on those studies that have been done, this is what she found, that actually 74 studies focused on PTSD as outcomes, about 39 on depression, and then 20 on uh, just anxiety in general. So 
to some degree, the literature has focused more on certain types of outcomes than others. She concluded that the most powerful predictor of, uh, of having these negative responses to uh, disasters was basically the degree of exposure to the various types of disasters. So that's one thing. A second thing that she reported was that basically studies outside the U.S. and other developed countries have tended to show the most negative effects on mental health. And partly that may be due to uh, methodology, but partly it's due to the fact that uh, there are things that, that societies can do in terms of providing disaster response. There are things that they can do in terms of preparation. And, and so, as I mentioned before, a lot of the d disasters outside of the U.S. and de developed world have basically uh, had huge death tolls. So, I mean, if you're looking at something like the tsunami with over 200,000 people killed and just widespread destruction, versus some of the disasters that we've had in the U.S., it may be an apples and oranges type of thing with just a whole lot more destruction in some of these other areas. And then the infrastructure af after a disaster to put things back together again makes a, makes a huge difference too. Um, peritraumatic reactions are really refer to reactions that occur within the first minutes and hours of, of a disaster happening. So peritraumatic, meaning, you know, during the event. Um, and so some of the things that people talk about in terms of that are things like if you're having extreme fear or distress, including thinking that you might be killed or injured. Are you having panic attacks or just signs of, of extreme anxiety that are occurring during, you know, the, the incident itself or just a little bit afterwards? Uh, feelings of helplessness, feelings of horror or disgust if you've just seen a lot of really nasty stuff, dead bodies. Uh, I mean, I know that probably some of us had a bit of that when we were uh, watching some of the TV even after uh, Katrina. Um, and then emotional numbing, which people talk about, um, or dissociation, which is basically that you're, you're so distressed by what you're seeing that your body and your mind just, just shut down and you can't really experience uh, the emotions associated with that. So these are some common peritraumatic reactions. Um, now, f now t two things about that, one of which is a lot of people experience these after disasters. I mean, they're during them. I mean, these, so they should not be viewed as abnormal. Um, and, and, and so if somebody, re you know, reports to you having this high level of anxiety or having a panic attack or something like that, um, you know, to some degree, you know, that's, that's, that's a normal response to a very, very stressful experience. And you shouldn't just say per se that if they have these things happening that that means that they have a mental disorder and that they need treatment. So why, why are these things important and why should we probably include them in our studies? Well, for one thing, people who have these at the extreme levels, not just have them at all, but have them at extreme levels, are actually uh, more likely in a statistical fashion to, it's a risk factor for, for some of the long-term problems that people may have. And so one of the things that we can do is that by assessing these things, we can actually get some information about what people, uh, which people may be more likely to develop problems in the long run. And panic attacks are basically one of the things that, uh, that we've looked at. And, and I, I view that as just a, uh, an extreme, it, it's an indicator of, of somebody being very, very distressed and scared and anxious in a situation. So in some ways, it's an indicant of, of, of how frightened you are by what's going on. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the things that we did in the study, which I'll, I'll talk about later, uh, in, in terms of 9-11, we, we asked a series of questions that allowed us to determine whether people had met the criteria for having a, a peritraumatic panic attack. And among people who did not have report having had a peritraumatic panic attack, 4% of them um, developed PTSD, whereas if they had a peritraumatic panic attack, over 
develop PTSD. So again, if you had that peritraumatic panic attack, it was a predictor really of who was, who was going to wind up uh, developing PTSD. Also, but a, to a somewhat lesser degree, it was, a, it was a measure of how likely people were to develop uh, major depression so that those who had um, no panic attack, the, the rate of depression was 7.6 percent and among those who had a peritraumatic uh, panic attack about a month uh, later, 24 percent had major depression. So again, it's a useful thing to have and it's a useful thing to include in studies. I mean, or, or if you're de dealing with patients afterwards, just asking about this can be a way of, of uh, gathering some, uh, some useful clinical information about who's, it doesn't say that they're absolutely going to develop problems because obviously uh, not everybody who had them developed problems, but it is something that's a useful clinical factor there. Now, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder as I mentioned before, has been the most commonly studied uh, type of, of mental disorder. Are you generally familiar with the criteria for PTSD, more or less, or you don't care at this point, you just want out of here? Okay, well, I'll assume it's that you're familiar with them, but if not, you can look it up. Anyway, um, there have been, studies have come up with all kinds of rates of post-traumatic stress disorder prevalence after it, um, after disasters, <clears throat> but there are a variety of reasons for that, including how you measure it makes a difference. I mean, sometimes people measure it continuously using things like the CAPS um, and then put a cutoff point to it. In some cases, um, you know, studies differ in terms of how intense the, the traumatic event was or how the disaster was itself. Uh, when you do the timing of assessments, I mean, there seems to be a, a high rate uh, immediately and then a decline, as I will show you later. And then uh, there's some uh, differences in terms of people's willingness to report PTSD symptoms and, and, you know, and how the researcher decides to define, you know, whether people have PTSD or not. So that, for example, in some cases, people will try to isolate how much of the PTSD is due to this specific incident versus how much of it is people who may have had PTSD before and, you know, it may be related to something else as well as this incident. So that may make a difference. Um, so if you're talking about, again, direct victims of disaster and you're looking within the first six months or so, uh, you know, that between 30 and 40 percent of these direct, highly affected uh, victims of disasters may have PTSD and that uh, it, it's lower among rescue workers and then it's even lower in the general population because the general population includes the whole range of exposure to disasters. Um, there have been very few studies that have actually looked longitudinally at what happens in a cohort sample of PTSD. And, uh, and so that makes it a little hard to know what happens in terms of actual change over time. And I will be, uh, I will be providing some information about that later. Um, and then there, another big question is, is like, well, do you get declines over time? Is there any, are there any new cases that come to be? And uh, I'll give you a, a foreshadowing. Uh, there are some new cases, uh, as I will be showing a little bit later. Uh, this, I mean, I, I guess I don't really have to describe 9-11 as a bad thing, particularly in New York City, so I will, uh, I will skip over this. But um, what we found um, that there were a variety of people throughout the whole U.S. that were uh, talking about having at least some PTSD symptoms pretty shortly afterwards. And that um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of major depression, we did find that, uh, that basically about 10 percent, roughly 9.7 percent uh, of adults in Manhattan um, a, a month or two afterwards met the diagnostic uh, criteria for a major depressive episode and that it was higher among people who lived uh, south of Canal Street on Manhattan. So again, as you got closer to the blast site or to the, to the uh, ground zero, the rates of depression were higher and that 
was sort of because some people were more likely to see these things than others and be directly affected. Uh, the rest of this is just to show that depression, uh, you know, PTSD isn't the only thing that actually people who are exposed to rape um, have, a, have a higher history of major depression that uh, sexually assaulted teenagers also have a higher uh, rate of depression than do other folks and that there have been several uh, studies that have looked at disasters that have also reported depression to be uh, an important uh, outcome of exposure to natural disasters. Now worry and fretting and generalized anxiety is something that uh, that's also common after disasters, according to those of us who've been through them. Um, and, uh, but, but that has really been studied less uh, in the empirical literature than, than several other types of things. And so some of the things might include um, if you have people who are just worried all the time. I mean, you're not like uh, you know, Homeland Security professional or anything, but you're spending a lot of your time worrying about uh, an excessive part of your time worrying about terrorist attacks. But, but worrying per se is not enough. You have to have some impairment in your functioning. It has to cause you some problem in your life in terms of worrying. So you might find yourself, uh, um, like if, if you know, for example, when the tropical update is, if you have to watch it every hour, when there's no hurricane, when somebody says there's a thunderstorm over, uh, you know, off the African coast and you have to worry about that, maybe that's a problem. And then, you know, it's also important to distinguish between something that's realistic and something that's, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, you know, clearly not so in terms of whether it's excessive in terms of worrying. Um, I'm going to move quickly to say that uh, throughout a recorded history, it has been noted that some ways that people deal with stress, including disaster and terrorism-related stress, is through uh, uh, various types of pharmacology here. And so you got your tobacco and your alcohol and all kinds of other pills and whatever. So this is not a new, uh, uh, I, I'm sort of uh, giving the lecture of the obvious here to you today. But at any rate, substance abuse has been uh, related there. And um, again, you can um, pour over this slide, uh, which you have um, later if you choose to do so. Um, but basically what we found was that in New York after 9-11 we did find that basically people were, uh, th there was a subset of people who basically increased their uh, tobacco use, their alcohol use, and their marijuana use following 9-11. That's one point, which is not necessarily illustrated on the slide. But secondly, the point was is that that was related in some degree, uh, particularly for cigarette use, to uh, to whether the, or not people had PTSD or not. That was a significant increase. And that for depression, uh, there was a significant correlation between people who were depressed and people who increased all of the substances, including uh, cigarette use, alcohol use, and marijuana use. So the point is, am I saying that the depression is, is or the PTSD is driving the, the use of increase there? I don't know. Because, I mean, we know that all these things are pretty addictive particularly tobacco, and so maybe it's a situation where people are already addicted and, and, um, and you know, it doesn't get them started doing it, but basically maybe it causes some type of relapse, the, you know, the stress for that, or maybe it's something entirely different, but it's, it's still an interesting little, uh, little finding. You may answer this later, but when uh, you're talking about sampling, how do you deal with a situation like New Orleans where your cases who were involved in the disaster not only lost their home address and their phones, but um, were widely dispersed afterwards? I mean, there was this huge lag of they didn't just go back right. home. Um, so how do you deal with trying to identify and follow those people in a situation like that? Well, the short answer would be with great difficulty. Um, and I think that actually uh, Ron Kessler, uh, I mean, rumor has it, I don't know that this is true, but I understand that uh, Ron Kessler talked somebody in the government to give him a large amount of money to try to track a lot of those people. And I have seen some, some studies where they've had some registries of people who have been in different places. But the, but the New Orleans situation would be the worst situation, which I'll get to 
in just a second um, about how sometimes these methods would work okay, but, but if you've got people fleeing to all parts of the country, then that's your worst case scenario in terms of trying to, to do anything uh, with the whole population. Uh, what I wanted to do, since I'm going to be talking a lot later about some results from telephone surveys, is I wanted to go through probably more than you ever wanted to know about uh, use of the telephone survey method. And these are the general topics that, um, that I'm going to talk about. So uh, rather than go through them one by one, I'll, I'll just get started. There are really two types of telephone-based methods. Um, and one of which is the typical kind of thing that you, that you hear about, which is that um, you, it involves using the telephone to both identify samples of people to be interviewed and then to interview them via the telephone. However, it's also possible to identify a sample by some other means. I mean, you might have a list sample of, of people who are affected or something like that, and then, and then use the telephone not to try to locate them necessarily, but to, but to then go ahead and interview them. And then um, a third possibility is to identify a sample by telephone. In other words, you locate a sample that you want to interview by telephone, and then to do some, uh, some type of in-person uh, interviewing with them. And there's also combination things. People do telephone and mail. Uh, people do telephone in person and mail and probably every permutation you can think of. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to, to kind of get to your question, the magnitude of the disaster and the sampling frame uh, that you're interested in dictates the type of sampling strategy and interview method that you use. If you have a small sample, or a small group of disaster workers or direct victims that you wish to study, there's little need to do a general population uh, sampling strategy. So in other words, if you've got an isolated group of people that you want to know about, then trying to locate them by using a broad net in a general population sample does not make a lot of sense. However, if you want to look at the impact on a large region, uh, a region rather than a probability-based sampling procedures are more appropriate. So there are three methods of sampling recruitment used in telephone-based methods. One is a list sample, and that's like you, you got a list of everybody. Maybe it's all veterans, you know, who lived in an area. Maybe it's uh, the Pan Am 103 family members, which, uh, which I'll talk about later. Um, so that's a list-based pre-existing sample. And then there's what's called random digit dial sampling, which I'll explain in just a minute. And then there's random digit dial involving oversampling of some groups of interest. So maybe I want to have more from one region than another. Maybe I want to have more women. Maybe I want to have more, uh, you know, different oversampling of a, of a racial uh, ethnic group. There are advantages and disadvantages of list samples. First, it's good when it contains a complete list of all members and it has accurate contact information. However, you can still do that by telephone in a very cheap, cost-effective way than having to go out and find them. Uh, and, but, but if the list is poor and it only includes those who have sought services, then uh, list samples are biased and cannot really provide good representative data on, on all members of the sampling frame. Um, now, why people went to random digit dial is that there is a list of, of people with telephones and it's called the telephone book. The trouble is, is that uh, there are many people in the, who aren't in the telephone book and you know, unlisted numbers and things like that. And there's a difference between people who are unlisted and people who are listed. And so therefore, that's why uh, people who use telephone books uh, stopped doing it and they went to trying to have other methods. So if you're using a telephone book, it's a very poor method to get a general population sample within a given area. Now, random digit dial 101. Uh, how many of you are familiar with random digit dial? OK, well, then I'll let you do this. Who would like to take over? No, just kidding. Um, first of all, what it is is it's a probability sampling procedure that was designed actually in the early 60s to reach households uh, 
with a phone that are within a given sampling frame. And it really was designed to address the problem of, of reaching households with unlisted numbers. And then what they do, is, and there are different ways of doing this, but basically you use area codes and exchanges within a geographic area of interest. And then uh, the RDD generates uh, a random series of numbers to complete a telephone number. So usually you start with the exchanges and it'll randomly uh, dial the last uh, four numbers or generate that number and in some cases even dial it as well. So then it calls, uh, you know, it calls the number, then rep, you know, reach a household and then you screen the household to find out if there's anybody in your sampling frame there. Like is there an adult here, is it an adult woman, is it whatever. And then uh, you qualify an individual and randomly select them for an interview. The advantages of RDD is it's a, it's a very efficient and cost-effective way to draw a sample of the population who live in telephone households, which is about 96% of households in America have households. In the U.S., telephone coverage is sufficiently high that a fairly small proportion of the population is excluded from the sampling frame. It's a lot cheaper and provides more quality control than in-person interviews. Now this is counterintuitive and you know maybe we can talk about this later. But it's not appropriate if there's poor telephone coverage or if there's widespread telephone disruption after disaster. So for example in Rita and, and uh, Katrina it would have been very difficult to do this uh, you know sh shortly after because so many people so much telephone stuff was out and everything else. Now, some general principles about telephone-based survey development is that the survey should be simple, uh, using clear language and well-designed questions. This is a problem for many of us. Uh, but you've got to listen to what it sounds like reading it, because you don't get any other cues. Close-ended questions work a lot better than open-ended, but it's possible to put open-ended questions, but then you've got the problem of coding them and writing them down and all of this stuff. Um, and telephone surveys that are relevant to respondents that capture their interest and that are relatively brief obtain the highest participation rates. So if it's interesting and relevant to people, if it's not going to take five hours, um, you know, it, it's going to uh, get a lot better participation rate. But a key task is, is really getting somebody's interest because it's much easier to terminate a telephone interview than in person. You know, now if you're in their house, I mean, you know, they got to get up and throw you out if they don't like the way it's going and they're on the telephone, bye-bye. So in other words, you've got to really engage people quickly. Um, a few things about RDD. Uh, one, in order to make sure that you're randomizing, uh, you know, and, and maximizing the chances that you're finding out about stuff, you should call the number multiple times at different times of day um, if you don't get somebody at first. Because there's, you know, people aren't at home, they work, you know, their likelihood of being at home differs, and so you don't want to abandon a number until you've, uh, you know, gone through several chances to get it. You have an opening script that tells what the study's about, uh, explains who's conducting it, uh, you know, establishes the legitimacy of it, describes the human subject's protection, uh, and informs them of their rights, and usually provides some way for them to verify that this is a legitimate thing. An 800 number is a good thing to do. You can, you can uh, offer to send an advance letter, uh, but I mean, again, that's an important thing to do. Um, the interviewer should have a script to answer frequently asked questions like, how did you get my number? Briefly explain that. Uh, why are you calling what this about? You know, is my stuff going to be confidential? You know, j just so that that's a good thing to have. And again, in our experience, uh, it's probably not necessary to pay people to be in these as long as it's pretty brief. Uh, for a cross-sectional study. However, if, you, if you're going to do a longitudinal study, it probably is a good idea to pay them for follow-up interviews and maybe even a little bit for the first interview because if you're going to send them a check, you need to have some place to send it. And, it's, uh, and that gives you, uh, gives you some good locational information 
for tracking them for long longitudinal research. Um, now, again, there's good ways to do this and bad ways to do it, but, but training and supervising interviewers is very, very important as it is in any research. And then a lot of the, the professional market and public opinion firms are well equipped uh, because they, ha they hold, have all these in a centralized facility and so they can monitor what's going on very carefully uh, in a way that cannot happen if somebody's just, you're hiring interviewers and they're calling from their home and you don't really have much clue as to what they're doing. Um, My experience with being an interviewer on the telephone, I'm finding like with veterans at least, more and more are using cell phones. So I'm wondering if how the random digit dialing it has that been affected by higher cell phone usage? Yeah. Um, it actually has been uh, to some degree, uh, but not much yet. Uh, the actual, there's a law in the U.S. against using automatic dialing machines to call cell phones because it costs people minutes. And so, um, what happens is if a human being dials a cell phone randomly, you can do that, but people are not, there's no federal law against doing it, but most of the big survey research firms do not include tel, you know, cell phones as a sample. What everybody says is, is getting to the point where it may be a problem, people don't think it's really a problem yet, but, but uh, again, uh, since the government and everybody else uses telephone as a major means for doing things, uh, not being able to access cell phones is going to get to be a point where it's a problem, but people think it's not quite there yet. Some subgroups it may be a problem, younger people for example, but, uh, but it's going to require a change in federal law to do it. Well, uh, you know what I think I'll do is that since the time is up, um, I will stop here and then uh, in, in, end our session now, um, and in the next session, I will talk about uh, some su human subjects protections issues, some other issues about uh, cell phones generally, and then also um, about some specific uh, uh, examples of disaster research uh, that utilize the telephone survey method. So this will be the end of the session now.